but it's hard when you feel that sense of like, man, why couldn't it, why couldn't it have been different, you know? That was the voice of my next guest who grew up with an abusive bipolar parent. If that doesn't sound difficult enough, wait till you hear what comes up next. Welcome back to season four of the podcast. I'm your host, Amanda Blackwood. As many of you know, I wrote my autobiography as a survivor of human trafficking. It's called Custom Justice, but if you didn't know, you do now. Keeping in line with that, this podcast has been dedicated to interviewing people who also wrote about their own experiences as trauma survivors and how they overcame the past. Stories of hope live here. She is an imagination coach, a contributor to Ford's women's articles that have garnered over 4 million plus views. She's the host of Unimaginable Wellness, and she's also the author of her debut book that's coming out at the end of October. It's a book for moms called Fertile Imagination. Her name is Melissa Lorena. Thank you so much for joining me today, Melissa. I just love you. I'm so happy you're here. I'm so excited, Amanda. This is going to be a blast. I just know it. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, you and I got to talking uh, while we were standing in line waiting for warm pretzels at Podcast Movement last month. And just the conversation just took some really amazing twists and turns. And I knew right away that I liked you. It's like, I need to keep in touch with this lady. Um, (laughs) So I feel the same way pretzels does that. It just bonds people in different ways, you know, the gooiness and the twistiness. So I'm Mm. there with you. You are a cool person. The beer cheese helps. (laughs) That was yummy. That was so yummy. So let's talk a little bit about you. Where are you originally from? Where did you grow up? I grew up in Astoria, Queens, New York. And I actually, I think I beat out my friends in terms of places I've moved since then. But that is where I am originally from. And it baffles people because I have an accent. And so they hear the Latina-ness in my accent But I'm actually a second generation New Yorker. My parents also were born in New York, but the accent comes from my grandparents, Puerto Rico and Cuba. So that's where that comes from. Wow, that's pretty cool. I knew when I met you that you had an accent, but it's very mild. It's lovely. Thank you so much. Thank you for that. I mean, it's, um, you know, it's one of those things like I'm sure anyone that's in another country that has an accent, like you just don't know, right? Because you're around people that kind of sound like you. So I didn't know I had an accent until I went to university at NYU. And then people were like, you have an accent. And I'm like, what are they hearing? (laughs) But then I got it. You're always a product of your environment. And just total side tangent. I noticed that the accent that people tend to pick up when they're around the ages of seven to eight, whatever's Mm. happened at that point in their lives, that tends to be what sticks with the most. So I love that. I have fought very hard all of my life to not let my Southern twang come out because I was living in Arkansas when I was that old. I can switch back and forth real easy. But then I lived in Scotland for a while and I could do the Scottish accent quite well. (laughs) <laughs> oh my God, you're sensational. So my twins are nine and we spent three and a half years in Australia. Are you saying that they're oh, always wow. going to say reckon and rubbish? Because that is so cute. They might, they quite possibly will, <laughs> unless so they make a conscious effort to fight back against it. <laughs> Probably. We are in Texas, so who knows what we'll be. Well, reckon's a regular word in Texas too these days. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I haven't <laughs> heard it. Y'all is the thing here, you know? Y'all. Yeah. Yeah. I hear that a lot. <laughs> um, <laughs> so tell me a little bit about your upbringing. I know you went through some pretty rough stuff and it kind of changed who you were as a person and kind of guided you down this different path. What happened? Yeah. So I always think to myself as an alien amongst my family. Um, When you look at my cousins, and a lot of us were and are about the same age, 
their life experiences early on were a little similar to mine, but where they are today could not be farther than another galaxy at this stage. Um, I was the nerdy one. I was the one that saw refuge in schoolwork. I was the one who somehow I was able to, despite being raised by a single mom with manic depression, and that's what it was called back then. I recently wrote my short story in a book, Fast Fallen Women, where they changed the name of my mom's mental illness. So that's what I know it to be, bipolar. And living in that environment, my mom had very volatile swings. She still does today. And so being in that space, literally 650 square feet of an apartment with my mom in Astoria, Queens, New York, um, I was really, really exposed to not so wonderful things <laughs> as far as, um, you know, police officers early on, you know, such as um, a lot of erratic behavior that was very difficult to understand. And also um, just this sense that there was something else going on. And I felt like maybe I'm crazy myself, right? So it's like, I can't say you know, because when I think about the past, I also put it through the filter of the present. And so there's a lot of words being used like gaslighting, narcissism, and all these other words. But back then, first of all, I was a little girl, so I definitely didn't know them. But back then, I, I have no idea if they like exactly match what I was experiencing. But what I can say is that I had all of that stuff going on around me. And for me, unlike other members of my family that were the same age in their own respective, very volatile homes, I saw school as like an escape. It was like, okay, I don't know what you got going on. Like, I, I think I see stuff here that is just like, wrong and wicked and all these things, but I need to get the F out of here. And I don't know how to even study because I literally didn't know how to study. And I don't know how to do homework because I was just clogged mentally with what was going on in, you know, on the outside. But for some reason, I was that little girl that during recess, and right now I'm going to tell you just how nerdy I am. I asked like the class valedictorian, I said, how do you study? Literally, I asked this kid during a time when everybody else was playing hopscotch and jump rope. But there I was. And I was like, hey, Stephen, you seem to get these like A's and your mom is a teacher. Um, Can you tell me how to study? And like, he literally told me like step by step by step. And this was before the internet and computers. And so I, I did what, what he said. So like his mom, as I knew was stable, <laughs> you know, like she, and she was a teacher and, and I saw that as, okay, maybe I can't get what I need in my home, but I need to get something cause I need to get out. And like, or unlike the my other relatives, my path <laughs> led me to full scholarships. It led me to get my MBA, Ivy League education. It led me to um, just figure this out without having seen anyone in my family do what I've done. Wow. And so it's, yeah, it, it was a, a really unbelievable experience and I want to see the silver lining. And I think that's why I wrote the book, because I think that's that's my answer. It's what I got out of that, an imagination. Oh, that's so cool. I mean, the power of the imagination is really an amazing and incredible tool. And when used properly, it really can propel you through uh, hard times or good times. You know, how did your trauma impact your life going forward after going through all of that? Did you have any kind of adapted behaviors? Did you have anything that you needed to kind of change later on? Oh, yeah. Like last night, like <laughs> I was like, I was like, okay, 
I feel abandoned right now, you know? So it's interesting, like anyone that has a book inside of them, like you go, you write your book and then you want people to read your book. And then you start thinking to yourself, well, if people aren't reacting to me, is it because they don't like me? Is it because all these negative self-talk things, right? Or just like assumptions and your mind goes all over the place. So last night for me, I was like, okay, because I'm big on integrity. And so if I say I'm going to be somewhere, I can be an extremist. And I'm sure that's part, part of the adaptive behavior too. So like, if I say to you, I am going to call you at this particular time and whatever, usually I'm going to do it, right? Right. Same thing with a book review. If you send me your book and you want me to review it, you know, I'll be honest, I might not read the whole thing. But you're going to see a review on Amazon. Like, I promise you that on the date that you told me. And it's not going to be, you know, stinky. It'll be it'll be good. So last night, adaptive behavior, right? I literally was like, wow, I don't have anybody to talk to. So I was like, huh, I could go down this path of like feeling sad, right? Or I can just be like, OK, I've been here before, you know, like I've been here before. And when I was, I was a little girl, you know, but now I'm 44. And so we would hope that I have more resources to figure out another way out of that. But still, like that's affected me, this this idea of like abandonment, you know, like I would think in a ideal setting, you'd be able to like call your mom. But then it's like, well, your mom's in a depressed state right now. So you're not going to have a conversation with your mom. You're going to have a conversation with a person, but you're not going to like what's going to be said. And that's going to take you down another path, right? Or call your dad. And it's like, well, my dad is not emotionally in this world. <laughs> he's 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 very much um, disassociated with emotions from his perspective. So for me to have a conversation of feeling abandoned with him, like he doesn't even know what was happening in my life. It, you know, he was involved, but that wasn't even in his brain. Like, oh, might there be issues? <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. It was more um, it was more like, OK, he's supporting me. And that was his his priority. Um, But so that's an adaptive behavior in the sense that I had to figure out how to walk my path, feeling as if. I have support when I look around and I feel abandoned. It's really hard, not, not, not going to lie to carry that, you know? Yeah. Cause it's still very present. Um, that's one. The other one is hyper vigilance for sure. Like to the hundredth power. And it's really hard when you have multiple children, like more kids than you have hands. So I have three kids, right? And I only have two hands that I can tell at this point. But what I've done is use my voice as my third hand. So if I'm in the street and I see danger, I don't care if I'm going to be embarrassed or if I'm going to embarrass my kids. I will scream and I will scare everyone around me because I see my voice as that third hand, a way to protect, you know? So there have been moments I've been a little jumpy. I'm not saying I'm a screamer all over the place, but like that's just something that I I've I've adapted. So it's it's good when you have a lot of kids to be quote unquote kind of vigilant. I don't know about hyper vigilant, <laughs> but but um that's a an adaptive behavior and obviously trust. Like that's an issue. Yeah. Like, you know, I can't say I've solved these things. I've tried to unpack them and un and I'm trying to understand, okay why do they pop up for me? And now I'm becoming a meditation practitioner. So I'm taking a course right now that helps me slow down that process. So I might react or I might do something, but then it, it gives me the tools I need to be super, super like thoughtful and present in the emotion, you know, which is pretty hard <laughs> if you're feeling abandoned and you're trying to go for feeling supported can you see the complexity here <laughs> oh yeah absolutely <laughs> anyway <laughs> uh, uh 
Anyway. So what helped you to heal from everything that you had to go through? Yeah. I mean, so there was this therapist um, that I went and saw on my own dime uh, when I was a freshman in college. So, you know, Amanda, as with anyone that's been through like traumatic experiences, um, you're not like unscathed. And I've got to be honest, sometimes it it has bothered me that you're not you're not like with scars, like physical things. So when they see you successful, they just assume that nothing. Oh, you've you always wrong. had a perfect life. Right, right, yeah. right. And I've, I've even gotten that. animosity for that, you know, animosity for for the for, you know, managing money the way that I've managed it, which is well <laughs> versus <laughs> versus other scenarios. Um and so, yeah. And so that's, that's a piece of the puzzle, but the, the therapist was like, she was so, that's the best part. I think if I had like someone documenting, documenting that therapy experience for a year during my freshman year, they probably would have seen absolutely nothing outstanding about this particular therapist because she almost didn't have a personality. She was super, super stoic. And it was just like, here I am, break out the tissues and let me tell you everything that's happened to me. But it wasn't like engaging or anything, right? But what I think I needed after 18 years of not saying things was to just say everything. Mm -hmm. Like I put it all out there. I just went to town and it was in saying everything that I began the healing journey. Cause for me, like I had been bulimic for years, you know? So I think it was, it was my high school experience that I was bulimic and I thought I would spend college bulimic. I was like, I could not fathom having a different relationship with food. Couldn't even imagine it. So when I went to therapy for a year, when all of a sudden I stopped, like it was like a miracle. It was a straight up miracle. And again, it wasn't like my therapist was doing theatrics. I literally just had to to tell everything. I had to just say everything. You know, it was it was so um necessary. As much as we all hate commercials, they are a necessary evil these days. That's what keeps the show on the air. You can show support by purchasing one of my mini books or donating through PayPal or even just leaving a review on whatever platform you listen to this podcast on. You can find the links for the books or donation options in the podcast description under the guest information. As always, a portion of the proceeds of everything made do go to local organizations that help fight human trafficking. Now back to the guest. And, and the other things that I've done through the years, they've included like other therapies. Like when I was living in Australia for three and a half years, um, that's where we spent the pandemic. It was not on purpose. We didn't know it was going to happen, <laughs> but we were there for key global moments, as I like to say. So the wildfires kind of, you know, were mm. the beginning of that moment. Yeah. And we had to drive 11 hours, by the way, from Sydney to Melbourne because we couldn't really breathe in Sydney. Oh. And then, yeah. And we then stayed in Melbourne for um, a month or two or three. I don't even remember. And drove back to Sydney. And then the pandemic happened and Melbourne got worse hit from a lockdown perspective. So we avoided that. But in Australia, I was like, you know, I'm really far from everything. Let me just, again, look at these experiences that I've had and let me really, really um, work on them. And so I saw another therapist. And so this had been the second in my life that was fairly consistent. And it really bothered me because the pandemic happened and then I couldn't go in person. And I know that, you know, you got virtual and all of that, but I, that's not what I want. I, I just got to be honest. Like I get the flexibility. I don't want that. I actually don't want to be like, on a screen sharing like my most private blah, blah, blahs, you know? And I feel yeah. like there's like, 
an energy to it too like like the therapist has some sort of energy to her and I'm not talking about an energy or him. I'm not talking about energy, like, you know, energy healing or anything like that. But just like there's some vibration that for me feels important, especially as I'm hyper vigilant. Like I need to feel like this person is not like a jerk. And I actually <laughs> need to feel that. And that's weird for me, but I'm like, I actually need to feel it. So anyway. Uh, long story long, I saw the therapist pandemic happen, had to take a pause. And, um, and ever since that, I was just writing a lot, just a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. Like, literally, when I came here, like, I found out even more news. I was like, Oh, okay. Thought it was, <laughs> I thought it was just that. And it's like, Oh, there's more. Um, So I found out even more news. And I was like, I journaled and I and I'm very good at coming up with like headers for my journals or prompts for myself, you know, so I was like, why am I really pissed off about this? You know, something that I had learned, like talking to myself, legit, but writing it. And so I just wrote at nauseam. I was just like, I'm pissed off because blah, 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 blah. And I just kept going until I felt a, like a full release in my body. I didn't have a therapist or anything at that time. And and then I got to a place where I was like, it, there was like a, a turn. So I wrote all these things. And then I was like, heck no, I'm not. This is not the way my story ends. Like this, like I was telling, like, this is like my Rocky Balboa kind of moment. So I was like, this is not how my story ends. And I've been in that place before. Like I remember as a kid, it was a really bad moment. And I remember being in the bathroom and we all know you watch movies. That's where people try to like take their lives anyway. And I remember sitting on the floor as one does. And I thought to myself, there is no way that my story ends like this. Like if, if anything, it would be out of, um, I don't even know what the right word is, but it's kind of like you can mess with me to a certain point. But I'm going to have a better life than you. And I'm going to rub it in your face. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, you know, and I have, which is really cool. But I'm still really angry and resentful. And I feel that abandonment. So <laughs> and it's not even about my mom. There's other parties that don't exist. Like I would never like even speak openly about other parties. Yeah. Um, so for me, it's like um, there's that there's that's how I've healed. It's it's through my own resilience. It's kind of like, like, I really think about my life, like a book and chapters. And for me, it's kind of like, okay, I started out really shitty, pretty shitty chapter. And I was like, okay, this thing, this thing better end on a freaking high. This is not going to be the Titanic. This is going to be some sort of like amazing story where like I win and I don't need anyone to lose for me to win. But but it's hard when you feel that sense of like, man, why couldn't it why couldn't it have been different, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of the stuff that most trauma survivors go through is stuff that we do have to fight back against for most of our lives. So it's perfectly normal that you still have that sense of abandonment from time to time and you still struggle with these things. And it's so nice to hear somebody say that life doesn't get perfect just because your circumstances change. We have to live with what happened to us for the rest of our lives. And we do have invisible struggles, but we're not invisible. Heck no, we're not, we're not invisible. I think, you know, when we were going through like the pandemic, not to keep going back there, but it's almost like it put a, a flashlight or something on people that I know to be very strong. Like I kind of felt, I've kind of felt a little resentment like and this is I can only share this because of the nature of your podcast. I felt a little resentment because I felt like people that were grown adults who have resources were really, really struggling with the pandemic. And I'm not talking about people that like passed away and had COVID and were like, you know, long COVID. I'm talking about people that didn't actually have those things going on that had nice houses and stuff were like really really like struggling like you could see the pain on their face 
And I got to be honest, when I noticed that, it got me mad. I was like, what? Like, you know, like it kind of brought that back. It was like, I didn't have anybody when I was a kid, like toughen up, you know? Yeah, like, What are you complaining about? Yeah. It's just like, yeah. what? what's wrong with, you? you know, like, and this wasn't something that I like shared openly, but I, but I did share this, which is if you're a survivor of any trauma and you feel that you've been through hell and back, I think it's, I think it's our duty to be honest, to help other people um, rise up in their own circumstances. Like I really do think, I think something that I've always struggled with is this idea of learned helplessness. And when I, it's interesting because when I went to NYU as an undergrad, I picked psychology as a major. And so, of course, before it was okay to talk about mental illness, I would tell people, oh, I just like the subject, which is complete bullshit, right? Like, I really wanted to know. The only thing I wanted to know was, am I going to get manic depression? The only thing. I could care less about like BF Skinner and all this other jazz, like wonderful, theoretical, but am I going to get it? And I think, you know, because I don't have it, because um, I can handle stress, clearly, <laughs> like <laughs> um, because um, I feel like I resourced myself, um, I feel like I could help other people do the same. And I never look at trauma in a way that's like, because people say little T, big T, right? I never look at it in a way of, of judgment in this way, even though I sounded judgy when I was talking about people in the pandemic. What I mean by this right now is if somebody is having a really hard time, let's say that they are trying to get pregnant and they're doing IVF or whatever, I'm not going to then say to them, well, you can't be as sad as I am, you know, when I had to call the cops and have them take my mom to the psych ward. You know what I mean? A, I'm, I'm not going to have that conversation. <laughs> B, um, that's a struggle for them, you know? And it's like, I feel like anyone that's been in a position where you've been able to rise up, I think it is our duty to almost by osmosis try to help someone else gather their own sense of resilience. Yeah. And sometimes it can be hard to start with such, such a large, I don't want to call them projects, but such, so much trauma. So sometimes yeah, if you want to get involved, start with something small, you know, start by helping a kid color a coloring page, start by offering your neighbor to bring in the groceries. You know, the more you begin to help other people in small things, the more you're going to be willing to help them in the bigger things too. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's and like it, exercising a muscle. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And I also think it's, it could even be even simpler than this. I mean, right now, you know, as someone who's coached individuals in a professional setting, Everybody has their face, you know, they wear this face for work, this other face for life, whatever. Once you start having a conversation with someone, even in a professional study, uh, setting where it's a little more personal, like asking them a personal question, and it could be something super simple and basic, kind of like, how are your kids? You know, do you have somebody in kindergarten now? Once you do that, forget it. <laughs> that's when, That's when you're really helping someone feel human again. Like that's enough. That's what I have found. Yeah. And you open up the floodgates then. Oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, for sure. Cause then it's weird. It's like, oh my God, did she just ask me about like the thing I actually care about? She doesn't <laughs> want to know what the PL statement, like the profit and loss statement number is <laughs> weird. So weird. So tell me a little bit about fertile imagination. Where did the idea for this book come from? Yeah, it started because I felt like I lost my own sense of imagination. So as I was saying, as a little girl, I needed my own coping mechanisms. And so I would always lay down in bed and the nights I could sleep. Um, I actually would 
almost like imagine like these random things. So maybe I lived in London. Maybe I went to an Ivy League school. Maybe I did X, Y, or Z. And whenever I would have these ideas, I would feel invigorated by pursuing them in reality. And they kept me really focused on doing things bigger, 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 and better. And if you think about it, with my mom having manic depression, you have your manic spells and then you have depressive spells. And so during mania, my mom was able to imagine really big too, right? Like she wanted to be a registered nurse. For her, that was big or a doctor. But the difference between my mom and me obviously is that I don't have the illness. And so I could actually like execute on the stuff that I wanted to pursue. So there was a bit of that, like something that I got from that experience, you know, being able to dream big, but then I can execute. And with the book, I wanted to figure out if I could find it again, because when I was a mom or became a mom and I have three little boys, I wasn't getting any sleep. That was just like obvious. And so I had a hard time dreaming for myself because I was also really propelled by um, running away from pain, right? So if you hear the story early on, I was trying to get out of my mom's house. And so then like, what do you do when you're like, not trying to run away from pain? It's like, I don't know how to go towards pleasure. This is so weird. Like, how do you make yourself excited? Like when you're not being chased by someone, you know, really hard to do. I think also part of the trauma stuff. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, um, and so when I wrote the book, that was the idea. I was like, okay, how can I find my imagination again? And how can I help other moms do the same? And I thought to write the book during the pandemic when I was in Australia. And honestly, I just got jealous. I saw someone wrote a book that I knew and I said, whoa, there's no way on this green earth that I'm not going to write a book if this other person wrote a book, right? Who knows if that's a trauma response, jealousy, but it fueled me and I wrote the book and I was just thinking about it and I had to make a decision. I was like, am I writing this for a working mom or am I writing this for, you know, an everyday sort of quote unquote non-working, even though they work more than even a working mom, mom. <laughs> um, and, and when I made that decision, I just started thinking to myself, I need a book that I need. Like, what kind of mom am I? And I'm kind of like in the middle, if I think about it, because I'm not, you know, at a corporate setting where my hours are fixed and then bleed into the rest of my life. But at the same time, I'm not a stay at home mom because I'm a coach. And so I sell my services to women entrepreneurs. And so that's the approach I took. It's like, well, with the world the way it is now, moms left corporate and they wanted to leave corporate for flexibility. And I want to give them an opportunity to use their imagination to chart their own path, leveraging everything that I've learned over the last 12 years, but then also in a way that pulls them closer to their kids. Like if we're really honest, anything that's out there that's helping a mom build her business is not pulling her closer to her kids. It's pulling us away from our kids. I'm not saying I'm going to write a book next to my child because that is stressful, but there's things that you can do with a kid, such as co-ideate profitable business ideas through the art of play with your child and exploration of new concepts and even technologies. And so I write about that in the book in terms of the three things that need to happen. So you need to reawaken your imagination. That's step one. Step two is about playing with, with your imagination. And some concepts here, they're really like, badass concepts. This is not like frivolous stuff. Like stuff like this has worked for people like Beth Comstock, the former CMO of GE. She literally in the chapter entitled Permission to Do Weird Things, she literally for GE would go to places that you just couldn't even imagine. Like she would learn how to do a tattoo. Like what does it have to do with GE? Who knows? But she figured it out because she has an imagination. And that was like a competitive edge for one business unit within the GE family. Same with moms. Leveraging these ideas, you can really design your lifestyle. You can really figure out how to even make stress be um, a tool that you use. And you could also even overcome imposter syndrome by not overcoming it, by using it as an asset, 
as Lisa Messenger, another person from my book who happens to be in Australia and so another entrepreneur. So that's the spirit of the book. It's really empowerment for moms and rediscovering your imagination. It's kind of like The Artist Way by Julia Cameron for anyone that knows that book about creativity, but for mom entrepreneurs. That is absolutely brilliant. So we've only got about two minutes left before we get cut off. But if you've got your book handy, I would love it if you could do a quick reading for us. And while you're doing it, if you're able to squeeze it in there, answer my favorite question at the very end of that. So I'll give you time to think. What is one thing that you love about yourself that's not related to your physical appearance? There's a lot more that's not related to my physical appearance. <laughs> All right. I like that. My brain. Okay. So read the excerpt first. Yep. Okay, cool. So I'll give it my best. Here we go. Me and my imagination, we were inseparable. Then something happened. I became a mom. I brought home my firstborn from the hospital. He was not a good sleeper. Was yours? In my early motherhood days, I didn't have that imagining time between placing my head on the pillow and falling asleep. I drop on the mattress and pass out. My imagination didn't stand a chance. Then when I had identical twins, the only thing I could rely on each night during that first year was feelings of overwhelm and dread. Was I going to make it? How would I survive another sleepless night? It was official. By this point, I had lost my imagination a once reliable friend and resource and the source of my audacious goals and big dreams. Several years passed where I couldn't even force myself to imagine something incredible for myself or visualize what would be possible in my life because being a mom to three boys felt like a cap had been placed on my dreams. Instead, I forced myself with very little energy to move through my business life, and sometimes motherhood. Could I ever bring my imagination back? All right. So now, Amanda, let me answer your question. Favorite non-physical thing. Oh, it's my resilience. My resilience, baby. <laughs> it's, I don't want to use it. I don't want to use it. Just like courage, right? I don't want to use it because that means that if you've enjoyed tonight's episode, please make sure you check out the episode description. You'll find links there on how you can learn more about this guest, links to connect with them on social media, and how to support the podcast. Remember, I don't get paid to do this. My boss is a bit tight-fisted, but I can say that. I work for myself. In short, this show really is all about the guest. If you've enjoyed their interview, please feel free to let them know. You can also tune in to the other podcast, Growth from Darkness, which is co-hosted by a lovely lady from Australia. We talk about what trauma responses are and healthy ways to move beyond the past. For more information, just go to growthfromdarkness.com.